Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. Today's review is of writer and director David Marmer's debut feature, 1BR, which is currently streaming on Netflix. After moving to LA to escape a grief-stricken past, Sarah, played by Nicole Bloom, finds her plans for a fresh start fall into the crosshairs of a cult-like community. And to help me read the fine print on my renter's agreement is returning friend of the show, Bernie. What's going on, man? Uh, you know, this movie makes me really appreciate my living situation right now. Um, <laughs> a little bit better than uh, than Sarah's, for sure. I was going to say, given that uh, you and I are both almost 30, which is uh, frightening in and of itself, but I'm sure we've had our fill of kind of uh, horror renting stories, but yes. none quite like this, right? You know, not quite a cult <laughs> trying to lull me into their uh, into their group, but we, we've been close. So I guess for starters with 1BR, what did you kind of think of the film's portrayal of like a stranger in a strange land where this girl is kind of fleeing this somewhat mysterious past of hers that all we know about is that it's kind of tragic and grief stricken. And yet it's kind of that traditional uh, somebody moving away from their hometown and then coming to start a new life in L.A. with kind of like a shaky plan of what they actually are going to do once they get there. What'd you think of that? I mean, I, I think people that have made that move before uh, to a new place where they don't necessarily know anybody, they naturally have that kind of anxiety of, you know, what's, you know, who do I call if something happens, God forbid, or, you know, if something happens to me, who's going to look for me in that kind of a sense. So I think the the director did a really good job of kind of building that storyline up and um, showing that you know, for lack of a better word, I guess, showing that anxiety um, on, you know, through those characters and and how Sarah really goes from being someone that's kind of confused to more, I guess, submissive. Um, And, you know, it's just the the story arc in and of itself, I think is just fantastic. And and the actors did a really good job of portraying their kind of specific roles in it. Yeah, I think that's a great starting point in talking about uh, Nicole Bloom's performance as Sarah. I mean, she does a really fantastic job of kind of just capturing that kind of like doe in the headlights look, uh, view that she has, or more like just her ability to kind of uproot her life because of something that happened. And then she moves to a new place where, like you said, she doesn't know anybody. She doesn't have the most solid plan. And then something that David Marmer does really well, I think, early on in the movie, which I'll get into it in a little bit, but I wish that he had stuck with this for longer in the film is that they portray Sarah as almost like an unreliable narrator, right? There's a lot of these, Mm -hmm. she has this mysterious past. She starts experiencing things in her apartment that nobody else can kind of like reference or nobody else has heard. Like she hears banging in the walls. She hears strange noises. And when she brings it up to other people, they're like, what are you talking about? Like my apartment's perfect or there's kind of just these little asides that people are able to talk their way out of. And especially like they bring up the fact that she takes medication, uh, like anti-anxiety medication. I think it's Xanax or something. And it's the way that she's portrayed early on with her portrayal of kind of her anxieties and uncertainty in life. It really makes for an unreliable narrator that I think makes the narrative more engaging for that setup. Cause the setup in and of itself, I think is pretty simplistic, right? A girl moves to a new right. location or a new city. She doesn't know anybody. She's by herself. She finds this very kind of like idyllic living situation. And mm-hmm. even though on the surface, the community and the apartment complex that she moves in is very idyllic in that it's exactly what she needs. Everybody's very friendly. They're very open and accepting. And yet it's of course too good to be true. Right. And so right. it's, a lot more interesting of an angle to take this idea. It's like, can we trust her as a narrator informing the viewer on what is actually happening? And that's mm-hmm. something that's introduced early on that I really wish they'd stuck with more, like at least until halfway in the film, because for a 90 minute movie, this is paced pretty briskly in terms of like how long it takes for her to move in, to start experiencing strange things. And then you have the big reveal, probably like what, 35 minutes in the movie or something like that. Uh, yes, yeah, something like that. I mean, again, for most movies, I think 
Um, like we had a discussion about this being having some overtones of the invitation. Um, we only really found out what was going on with, you know, 20 minutes left in that movie, something like that. I mean, this is in the first third of it. So um, again, you, you have to have a really strong script and, and really good acting for that to keep going. Cause um, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, like Sarah, the played by Nicole Bloom, she's a really, really good actress. Um, he really helps carry that storyline. And again, I think, you know, throughout that movie, you, you really feel the anxiety that she's displaying, even through like those kind of fake smiles. Um, so I, again, I think it, it really helps drive home the point of, of, you know, what was basically taking place in there and, and how crazy it was. Yeah. So I think for, in terms of the script for the film, I'm more in love with the concept than I am the actual dialogue in the movie. But I do think to Marmer's credit is that, again, like the way that it's paced, it kind of, it does enough early on to make you suspicious of everything. And then you have the big reveal, right? The reveal being, hey, this is not the picture perfect uh, community that we thought it was gonna be. This is actually an apartment complex that is run by a cult essentially. And we find mm -hmm. out that in fact, she is a reliable narrator, right? It's not just, oh, hey, I'm hearing things and experiencing strange things. It's like, no, these things are actually happening. And I think it's really interesting the way that this movie is paced in that you have all that happen in the first 30, 40 minutes. And then the movie doesn't really lose steam because it picks up a new angle to tackle, which is kind of like breaking down the society of this cult within this apartment complex and showing us all the different layers and whatnot. But I mean, early on, what did you think? Did you think that Sarah was a reliable narrator or did you think that this movie was going to be more about this kind of damaged person bringing that damage those kind of like lingering trauma just to another coast like it doesn't matter that she decided to move back move away from the east coast because her problems kind of followed her to the west coast right i think it's more the latter of what you just said um you again they mention that she has anxiety issues. They mention that she's on medication. We see her waking up and having these odd, you know, do we know are they hallucinations or is it real, right? She opens up uh, her oven and her cat's burning up in there. And I mean, you know, things like that where, you know, just her kind of, the, the way that she went about herself, you don't really know again if what you're seeing is at least again for that first part of it uh is real or if it's some sort of weird hallucination and um you know we're seeing this from a very different angle so again i think to your point when we start to realize that um no this this is a real thing that she's having to deal with um you know we start to build more trust and invest more into that character um because for the i mean if let me ask you to do this way. Do you think if, if she didn't play as good of a role as she did, that we would, that the movie would be as believable in terms of like the, the like non-speaking kind of acting that she did, right? The, that kind of portrayal that she did, it was just, it, at least for me, it was very powerful. What did you think? Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, she gives a very physical performance in the sense that she doesn't make scenes where she has no dialogue and you're kind of just like in the space of a scene with her. You can kind of, you can feel her tension. You can feel her unease. And just the, right. again, like the way that she carries herself in those scenes, it doesn't come off as feeling goofy or forced or any of these things. You literally are seeing this woman that seems like a person, again, that is a stranger in a strange land in a way yeah. that is, doesn't feel very like glamorous or Hollywoodized, right? A lot of times in those movies, there are types of films where it's like, oh, I'm going to start a new life in LA to pursue my dreams. Like it's kind of this very pretty person that is super confident and bubbly and all these things. And she's very reserved in a lot of the film until obviously things get pretty crazy for her. Uh, she's incredibly reserved for the most part. And it does come off as being very believable in a way that it makes the overall, whether you buy into the premise of, hey, this is a cult run apartment complex in LA that she can't escape from, like whether you buy into that premise or not, I think has a lot to do with Sarah, right? This is an idea that is out there, but at the same time, the way that she is able to sell it, I feel like mm -hmm. she sells it to the audience. She makes it feel like this is 
a rea- that this could be a reality in a certain sense. And not just, and I mean, part of the credit has to go to Marmer for crafting this world, crafting this setting, situations and the characters that are within it. But I mean, Sarah's performance, I think for me, really captures everybody, an experience that everybody has had at some point, right? At some point, a majority of us have had to move somewhere, have to go live somewhere where we don't really know anybody. We feel like we're on our own, we're on our own basically, whether we can call somebody or if there are one or two people we know, like that's a very scary thing. And just, again, the way that she carries herself throughout basically the entire movie, like it really, really puts you in her shoes in terms of like, hey, this is too good to be true. And then you're basically like holding your breath until there is a reveal and it's either gonna be this community is fucking nuts or this girl is fucking nuts. Um, Right. What did, what did you think though of the kind of just the build up to that cat in the oven? Because I thought that was like the again the way that the film is paced. When that mm-hmm. scene hits, it hits a lot harder than I think it ne- it wouldn't necessarily have if there wasn't that doubt cast as to whether she is lucid or not. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I believe it was Lester played by Clayton Hoff who. Um, seem just very very odd the gentleman with the one eye correct yeah uh, and the glasses yep. yeah um he i remember at the very beginning he handed her that book and he was being very sketchy um as she was kind of as sarah was ogling uh brian played by giles matthew um and he, again you just you we've all seen something like that happen before been um, not necessarily in that situation, but seen that situation unfold where um, someone has that kind of anxiety pop up um, or that's, you know what I mean? So, I mean, once we kind of like get through the cat barbecue scene, we're given a pretty clear cut answer that Sarah is not imagining any of this. This is really happening because then she gets jumped. And then there's the reveal that like the guy that she has been kind of, giving eyes to who's her neighbor, Brian, who's played by Giles Matthew. I mean, he is in her apartment and he's tied, he's zip tied her to a chair and then she breaks free and which is kind of a funny line where she smashes the chair and kicks him. And he's just like, God damn Ikea or something like that. Cheap piece of shit furniture. But I mean, and then she runs out of the room and she tries to get help from one of her neighbors and the neighbor is like all annoyed, like, what the fuck? Why is she out? What is going on? And you realize that, the, no, actually the entire community is in on this. And what is happening is like sanctioned by everybody that lives there. And then she gets knocked out and she wakes up in her, what used to be her room, except all of the uh, amenities that she had put in there are gone now. And the windows are all boarded up. And this is where the movie I think gets really interesting in terms of just like the portrayal of a cult in an urban mm-hmm. setting but also it reveals just how minimal the film is. Like it's a very minimalist film. There's not a lot of kind of effects or gore or big set piece moments. It's basically just shot in a literal apartment building an apartment complex. And there isn't a lot of kind of the grandiose flashiness that you might assume that some of these movies might get. But at the same time, it is super effective at kind of capitalizing on its restraint in a lot of ways. I mean, The biggest thing for me is the little details that you can pick out of the environment. Like early on when she's walking through the apartment, she notices that there's like paint over parts of the walls and it looks like it's been a quick patch job because you can see that like, oh, there was some damage there. But it's kind of just a Mm -hmm. brief moment early on and you don't pay a lot of mind to it. And I mean, purposefully, the camera kind of just like pans to it. It sits there for a second and then it moves on to the next thing. And then you're kind of like, That was kind of like a weird moment. But then we come back to it 20 minutes later and we learn the significance of that. And I mean, what did you think about the significance of that, which is going to bleed into kind of when the film takes an even more sinister turn? I mean, again, I think the way that the director sprinkles in these small little, you know, Easter eggs throughout the movie, they really do culminate, um, Mm -hmm. you know, towards kind of the climactic uh, you know midpoint there um i again i just i think the the way that this was acted and and the way that this was written was so strong mm-hmm. um and as we go through that you start to pick up a little bit like have you ever seen the stanford prison experiment i haven't but i know what it's about 
Yeah. So, you know, for those folks that don't, there was basically an experiment where a group of, I think it was like 10 kids, five were prisoners and five were, you know, the, the guards basically. And you saw very quickly, um, you know, the people that got into power, they really dominated those other folks. Um, they were very brutal to them. You start to see that mindset kind of build as she's in that jail and like she gets her hand like nailed in right and crazy shit like that and you're like again as a human being you're just watching this and you're like how how does someone get there but then you think back to you know when she ran out originally and i believe it was esther played by ernestine phillips who kind of catches sarah and you know in theory she was going to help her and obviously we find out that she's part of that cult um but she was she had like a dead look in her eyes because she's been completely kind of brainwashed to this point where she doesn't look at sarah as a person that's just somebody that we're going to control and it's kind of an eerie mindset to that where these guys are just caged in you know i think brian said they were there he was there for the past nine years Imagine how, you know, if that's your day-to-day -day life of, you know, believing those four crazy tenants or whatever the hell they were, um, to that extent, like, you're you're not going to be anywhere near a logical or reasonable person. And again, we saw that kind of demise for, quote-unquote, demise for Sarah um, through that. It was really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic point. And again, there is a lot of restraint, I think, because... I feel like there is the tendency, especially for first time filmmakers, they're like, oh, I need to have that grandiose preacher of a cult or something like that who kind of just spouts off this uh, this rhetoric that they have and whatnot. And I feel like for the most part, the portrayal of the cult is very low key in a way that makes you believe like, hey, if you walk next time you walk by an apartment complex, you don't know what goes on in there. That kind of thing right. where it's like from the outside, it looks very normal. And even from the inside, it looks normal because they're able to fool tenants until they're ready to be like, hey, you're going to be selected and you're going to become one of us and become indoctrinated, basically, or otherwise you get killed. Um, but I mean, again, coming back to kind of just the minimalist nature of the film, that scene when Sarah realizes what's going on and they tell her to like assume the position, which is basically she has to put her hands on the wall and then back up all the way. So basically like her butt is out in the air, basically like initially I assumed that that was going to go to a much darker place than it actually goes. And for a first time filmmaker, that really surprised me that it doesn't go that route where this route that she gets assaulted. Right. Cause I feel like a lot of times, especially like super indie horror sometimes has a tendency to go for those more shocking moments or shock, like shockingly degrading moments. And I thought that the restraint to not make it about that, to make it about like, very real a realistic portrayal you want to break down these people till their willpower is nil so you can basically like recode them into what right. you want them to be i not only thought that showed a lot of restraint but it also is a smarter take because obviously the shock value there i don't know how much that's going to play in terms of the rest of the film and again right. i didn't think that the dialogue for this movie was necessarily very strong so if the story starts to wane in the second half after there's some elaborate assault scene, it wouldn't have really sat well with me because it would have just felt like shock value, right? It's there to kind of shock the audience and disgust them, but then there isn't much substance after that. So I feel right. the idea to shy away from that and then mm -hmm. to focus more on the community as a whole and the cult, because eventually we see after the trials of tri and tribulations that Sarah goes through, like, to the point that she has to stand like that against the wall for hours and hours. And then if she falls over, like they nail her hands to the wall, literally uh, like it's super disturbing, but then we get to see what it's like on the other side. We get to mm -hmm. see what the community, like the foundation is. It's not just us listening to them talk about, Oh, this is what we believe in. This is our routine. Like we're shown that. And we are shown like Sarah almost buying into it to a certain extent. And I think that that is a much more interesting angle to take with this film than, than it becoming kind of just like, I thought it was gonna become like a rape revenge film where she gets assaulted, they leave her for dead. She's not actually dead. She comes back and kills a bunch of them. And that would have just been a far less memorable movie for me personally. What about you? No, I, 
I fully agree with what you're saying. I, and I also think if they did that and this, you know, let's say this movie is the same thing, except with that kind of violent um, assault scene, uh, that just seems completely out of place and out of pace with what the movie was talking about, right? It's, although that it's very, you know, when we go from point A to point B in terms of her like entering there the first time to her being like in that pen or that prison cell essentially, um, you know, it's the pace is not something where I feel like that would have that would have worked. Um, but the other key thing to that is I think one of their tenants was something about security and they all want to be peaceful with each other and be able to like you know, there's a scene basically where they slap a guy, like everyone like walks in, yeah. in order, slaps him. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like passing the Brussels sprouts in the next scene to someone and like laughing. So this idea of like, there's selective punishment, but then we move on from it afterwards. I don't think, I don't think that would have been with the ideals, you know, quote unquote of what they were trying to do in this. Um, what did you think about like you know, I, I forget the gentleman's name. Was it Charles Charles Doherty or something like that? Davery, the the founder of the cult, Charles D. Ellis, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's not the major point, but um, he's talking in a very like the the video kind of reminded me of the Soviet Union. I don't know why when I was watching it, it's just very like eighties old school, and he's talking about things that are. You know, we want to live in a utopian society and, you know, we're all going to work together and, and, you know, everyone's going to be peaceful and there's no poverty. And it's like you see that and then you see what's going on in order to enforce that. Do you think that there was political overtures or am I just the byproduct of Soviet parents <laughs> and I just keep seeing that everywhere? No, I think that what you're cap- what you're bringing up is a really great point in that and it's why Sarah almost becomes indoctrinated right because you hear that what that guy is talking about on TV and you're like oh man that all sounds great everybody lives in harmony if you make a mistake yeah you get slapped in on the wrist or literally the face but at the end of the day like everybody embraces you at the end of the day because it's a community we're nothing if not for the person to the left or the right of us and it's very interesting to see, again, in the back half of the film, we see how the indoctrination begins. We see it, what people go through, they suffer. We see like children in a classroom watching this video and this guy spouting this rhetoric that on paper sounds fantastic, but then we get firsthand experiences later on. And so does Sarah, obviously. And we realize, hey, in practice, all this stuff is fucking horrific and there's no free will there's no choice in anything i mean eventually sarah gets married as soon as she gets accepted she gets married off to lester who she doesn't have any say in that they're just like hey lester's wife died which is sad but now you're going to be his new wife and there's no kind of like debating or conversing about it at the same time we see what happens when you lose your uh you lose the ability to kind of like facilitate your role i mean there's the the older woman that she becomes friends with edie and as soon as Edie gets to the point where she's too elderly, she's got essentially what is dementia and she can't function in the community or basically like pull her weight as it were, they put a bag on her head and they pump her full of oxygen and suffocate her. Like it's a horrifically morose scene and it really starkly spells out the realities of the situation. Cause you see Sarah get comfortable. She's like, Oh, everybody's all smiles around. And then she gets that kind of wake up call where it's like, actually your life will be taken from you if you do not service the community in the way that they intend you to. So, I mean, who's to say if she gets married off to Lester, they're supposed to have children, hypothetically? What if she can't have children? What if he can't have children? Like one of them has to go then at that point, right? I mean, I would assume. I mean, to that point, there's a scene um, where she walks in and she sees Lester teaching you know, six or seven kids there. And then again, you start to think about, okay, well, there, there, there is some sort of weird kind of a plan to make this thing grow. Um, but, you know, again, we were talking earlier about kind of like that violent assault scene. That was, that would have been completely out of place. 
this was horrifyingly perfect, you know, in, in terms of how the, the plot and narrative was moving because you see her initially really want Brian and she's a free will kind of person in that sense, right? And then she gets into this group and the person that she was afraid of and, you know, despised the most, you know, theory, right, in that early sense, um, was the person she ends up having to marry. So it's just, it takes a weird, very weird circle. And uh, I won't jump to the end to which one of the scenes I really enjoyed with where that relationship comes into full circle as well. Um, but I mean, so you said that um, you're not a fan of the dialogue, which to be fair, there isn't very strong dialogue. Cause I don't know if there necessarily needs to be too much of it. Um, but what did you think of that? that kind of plot twist toward the end where her friend comes into the um, into the community and she starts watching her, um, you know, go through the same trials and tribulations as she did. Yeah. Again, like I really, I really love the second half of the film just because it's giving us that big moment where we get to look behind the curtain, right? We get to see what was going on when she was in her friend's shoes. Like when she moved in initially, She's hearing all these crazy noises and these pipes clanging. And basically all of that is done to destabilize her men, uh, mentally, essentially. It's to make her sleep deprived so she's more susceptible to influence and different things like that. And getting to see them orchestrate all that on the other side of the wall, I find to be really fascinating just because you get to see the inner workings of something. It's not just, they didn't just kind of abandon those events. They gave us more context for them, which on a rewatch, like I rewatched it for this, um, I thought that the first half of the film is stronger because you obviously now know the meaning behind it. It's not kind of just these random events that they piece together and then they never return to them. It gives the whole entire movie more context, which is more meaning, which is more appreciation kind of for the, it's a simplistic premise and yet the director and writer, David Marmer, goes to the lengths to fully flesh those out. Um, mm -hmm. And even like little bits of dialogue you pick up on, like when Sarah is part of the community and she is in the security booth with Brian and there, where there's cameras everywhere, they can watch people. And she's like, well, who's watching us or something to that extent? And he's like, we yes. don't ask that question. Don't worry about it, basically. Which, of course, leads to the idea that there is a larger conspiracy or there's a larger group or presence um and they don't really focus on that for long it kind of is just a, a moment but then of course at the end of the film it ties in um in a way that's really satisfying i think but um in terms of bringing her friend back which was originally what you said and i'm ranting a little bit um i think it's great that they reintroduce her because her character having that brief moment of dialogue with her early on it sticks with her and yet she has an opportunity before that when she's in the room and she's asserting the position against the wall. She has that moment where she thinks about what she could fight back in a way. But once yeah. again, she's not able to kind of take that leap of faith in stepping up for herself or kind of like facilitating a role in her, a more, a more aggressive, I guess, role in her life where she's like willing to stand up for something rather than kind yeah. of because... She describes herself as being like a daddy's girl, I think, which essentially mm -hmm. means like she is very um, impressionable to a certain extent, not necessarily submissive, but she is not really motivate. Her actions are more guided by others than herself. And so right. to reintroduce the friend in that regard, I found to be really fitting because again, now she has this moment where it's like, hey, this is the last chance for you to mm -hmm. actually try to live a lifestyle or live a more purposeful and determined lifestyle that you're not going to be able to get if you're going to end up muting this or uh, shoving a, a screwdriver in this girl's ear. Right. Well, I mean, again, I think you look at the disparity uh, in her actions between when she's doing that versus when she's seeing her father uh, who comes in, you know, tries to figure out what's kind of going on with her and reconnect with her in some kind of a way. And there was a moment where she kind of lets in when he apologizes to her. And then um, Brian, you know, kind of sneaks out from behind him and has a knife, which he's ostensibly going to stab him and kill him, right? Um, so 
she does a move that's selfless, which is ironically one of the kind of tenets that they teach um, in, in being mean to her dad and, and, you know, making sure that he gets away from them um, and thus saving his life. But she also ends up killing, in theory, his the relationship with him. Um, so seeing that and then seeing what she does and her finally kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, kind of she just, you know, her she rages on on the the gentleman Jerry when um, he's holding down her friend. You see, like all that pent up emotion kind of finally burst out. Um, and then again, when we start to realize this crazy idea that again, this is a community, it's not one leader. Um, and it kind of goes into your point of like, who's watching us. Um, it's everyone's watching each other. That's why that community is so scary. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, again, not to blabber on my own, but it, it just, it has so many very interesting overtures to, you know, crazy things like, you know, what happens in North Korea or communist countries like that. Um, so to see that in a very, uh, you know, in an LA kind of an environment, um, you, it freaks you out because, you know, not to sound terrible to those people, but like, you know, that's not unplausible right. in, in certain parts of this country. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, the director just does a great job of portraying it to that effect. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, like, his ability to portray this as being very plausible is what makes this movie that much more disturbing, right? Yes. This idea that, again, there's nothing really fantastical about what's happening. It's a group of people that ostensibly were coming from different places for different reasons. Like LA is basically like a, bre not a breeding ground, but it's basically like a beacon for people that are looking to start a new life. And it's a one bedroom right. apartment. They have to be single mm -hmm. or they have a couple and chances are they're not going to accept couples because who knows whether they're going to be able to get both people. It's probably hard enough to recruit one person, let alone two people. So the setup for this film is really not that and not that unbelievable. And especially when they break it down, they kind of, they break down not only their willpower, but then this idea, they're able to break down this cult into the four pillars of what it means to make up a community. And mm -hmm. again, when you are probably like sleep deprived and um, like physically, emotionally, and all of these things, you're broken. If you're hearing things like community, security, caring and all these different types of pillars that make up a community yeah that probably sounds pretty enticing and it probably sounds pretty good so the idea that this cult is presented in such a kind of like calm and concise manner like there's nothing really unreasonable about it on paper obviously again once we get into practicing what's on paper it gets a little nutty and well, a little bit is a big stretch uh so I think that that is what makes this film work for me so well. And again, to, to reference uh, The Invitation, that's why that film works so well for me. Again, there's all of these kind of nutty things that are in the basis of those religions or these cults rather, not religions. And yet the presentation is so grounded in a way that you could see this happening. I mean, the old, like especially the times we're living in, how often do you hear of like alternative groups or spiritual things and all these different things that they're not really have a basis in something that's established. It's kind of like far out. And while right. a majority of those I'm sure are not cults or have kind of these crazy extremes going on with them, the presentation of them in both of these films, I feel is done in a way that, yeah, this, why wouldn't I want to be a part of that? All these things on paper sound fantastic. And if you're a person like Sarah before she's even like mentally and physically broken, she's on her own. She has no, fa she's ignoring the family she has left, but in LA, no friends, no family, no real job prospects. She's like a temp or something to that extent. And it makes sense that she would become indoctrinated in that even before she's like deprived of sleep and physically drained and all of these things. Right. I mean, I think you're describing why people flock to Scientology. Uh, <laughs> uh, please don't don't attack me on social media. Uh, they, but, make, uh, they make up like two thirds of my listener base. So that's a problem. Oh, oh. <laughs> <Mazel tov>. um, <laughs> um, but, you know, again, you know, taking it towards the end there. Um, I w what did you think of the ending uh, and how that that kind of ended coming about? 
so I was a fan of it, I guess. I wish okay. that, well, let's, let's back up a minute. So I like that she kind of, Sarah has that moment where she's like, no, I'm going to take control of my life. I'm going to take charge of my life. I'm going to lead my life in a direction based on something that I choose, not something that you choose. Cause that's a very pivotal moment when Jerry is telling her, Hey, you need to maim this girl with the screwdriver right. and the hammer and all these things to punish her basically. And you see that she has that moment that I'm sure is resemblant of the relationship we have with her father, where a male, an older male, is trying to convince her to take her to do something that will turn her life into a specific direction and lead her down a path. And while hopefully her father wasn't trying to convince her to maim people with uh, with Home Depot tools at some point, but it's still the same idea, right? The idea that a male oh. is trying to influence her life in the direction she goes in. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with Jerry, it is a much more drastic and uh, fucking physical and disturbing angle. But right. this is her moment, right? To stand up to somebody that's trying to influence her in a negative way with some ways she doesn't agree. And so mm -hmm. it was incredibly satisfying for her to kill him. Not only once stabbing him with the screwdriver in the neck, but then stabbing him like multiple times because that's very cathartic, right? This idea that mm -hmm. she's been having this repressed anger for not only just the film, but probably like five years or so prior to that, because she's fairly young. And whenever this affair that her father was having when her mother was dying of cancer occurred, like she was cognizant of that. And she's been carrying that rage and that anger for a very long time. And to see her wild out on this dude with a flathead screwdriver is like super cathartic. And it is something that finally gets to give her some sort of like release valve, which she so desperately needs the entire movie. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, like, I love that since Brian is such a creepy scumbag, him getting capped, well, mm -hmm. well, well deserved. Um, and then, of course, like her getting to escape at the end. And Lester basically like Lester is interesting because you view him as creepy initially. Then you realize like, hey, he's actually trying to help her initially. And she didn't buy it. So then right. again, like they're going to get married and it gets creepy again. But then right. at the last minute, he realizes like, hey, I shouldn't submit this girl to the hell that he is living in, basically, because it's interesting, too, because Lester ends up killing himself, right, to sacrifice himself so she can escape. And you wonder how many people in that cult are like Lester. You wonder if there are others like Lester that feel trapped, because not everybody in the cult feels trapped. Some people in the community right. feel like, hey, I'm in the community. This is my, these are my people. This is my purpose in life and all of that. They buy into it, but there has to be a certain amount of people that do not buy into it. Like Lester does like Lester. I mean, Lester is manipulated by her to a certain extent because he's kind of half in half out. And as anybody mm -hmm. knows with anything, if you're going to dedicate your life to something extreme like that, probably you can't be half in half out. You got to be, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid right. or I'm taking small sips from the back of the pew. Right. So, right. In that regard, I really like that part of the ending. Um, how about you? So, I mean, yes, I, I echo everything that you just said. Um, I really enjoyed the fact that, uh, you know, not just Lester sacrificed himself, but if you noticed at the end, the keys fell outside. Yeah. So now they can't ever leave, or at least, you know, in theory, they can't buzz themselves in and out. Um, so, you know, you're you're trapping the other people in there for good while you're sacrificing yourself and letting her run off. Mm -hmm. But um, I will disagree with you just on the sense I, I understand in principle that there was, you know, numbers wise, there's probably going to be a few other people that are like Lester, but in those shots, when Sarah is being basically surrounded by the, those people, mm -hmm. they did not seem to care much about when she was saying we can leave mm -hmm. i felt like he was the only one that kind of put his head down right you know what i mean um so i i agree with what you were saying but like the, that group just seemed so out of their freaking <laughs> mind and yeah. again when that moment when brian mentioned that um jerry was not the founder right. it was charles right mm -hmm. and this the unitarian or i forget what uh, the specific word it was but um there is no leader here mm -hmm. we are all the leader and we're all people and um you know it i don't know it 
it, it that just freaked me out. Yeah. Um, but I, I will say this. I was not the biggest fan of the very end. Right. Uh, in terms of like her running and that whole area was the CD properties or whatever that group was yeah. uh, with the sign, right? Basically the entire neighborhood, which consists of nothing but apartment complexes, are all parts of the same cult. So when she's running away down the street, you see the alarm start going off, which signifies the fact that, hey, there's all of these cults. It's not just a singular one in this one building complex. They make up the entirety of this neighborhood in LA, which feeds into the comparisons to uh, the invitation where it's like, this, that is, I will agree, that is what kind of annoyed me about the ending of this movie is how similar it was to the invitation. And the, it's the same idea, right? At the end of the invitation, right. They're looking off into the hills um, in L.A. and they see that the red lanterns are in multiple people's um, backyards, which means that, hey, there have been other slaughters of innocents as a result right. of the cults. And the, it's not a singular event. It's a multiple events that occurred all over this one area. So I like the idea that there is a widespread cult and a widespread threat, but I kind of wish they'd done something different that signified the idea that, hey, the struggle is not over. I think it would have been right. it it probably would have been more interesting if she's like taking a police statement they're giving a police statement basically on what's happening and then she notices that one of the cops has the insignia behind his ear yep. or something like that that would have mm -hmm. been a much more kind of subtle and well not subtle really because he's got a fucking burn mark behind his ear but it would have been something that signifies that the threat is everywhere and the threat is also in a position of power this wasn't just right. some kind of group of nut jobs in an apartment complex this, these are people that have infiltrated other uh, positions of power within the country. Like, it's right. not just, maybe it's not even that it's just an L.A. thing. Maybe it is all over the country, which would have been mm -hmm. equally as terrifying and would have definitely been more original, I think. Right, more original and powerful. I mean, again, there's just, she's running and she's bloody and that whole time she could have, I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm being kind of ridiculous in this criticism, but like she's sprinting down the street and then she just stops and starts looking around. It's like, why the fuck aren't you running and screaming or something, right? You're covered in blood. And like, that's where I, again, I I think the, the script was written really well, but I understand having certain overtures and, and um, certain similarities with a, a movie, but that really was kind of a copy and paste ending from the invitation just in a, a little bit of a different manner. Mm -hmm. If she ran out and then a police officer stopped her, like you said, and as he's, you know, she's sitting next to him, she notices that he has the mark there mm -hmm. and that's how it ends. It's like pulling back up to where she just was or, you know, something akin to that. Then it's something where, again, this is very original and, and it has a, I think, more powerful ending than her running down the street, which like, okay, it's a fucking block, like, and they can't leave anyways. So it's not like anything's going to necessarily happen. It's yeah. just, it gave me a little bit of a migraine towards the end. <laughs> not accomplished. I think that, you know, overall though, I think I would much rather be a little dissatisfied with the last 40 seconds of the movie than the movie as a whole, obviously. Um, at the same time though, that ending doesn't kind of undo all of the legwork, right? That's in the rest of the film. Like, yeah, it's, that's the, probably the most underwhelming moment of the movie for me is when she steps outside and then all the lights go off and you're like, oh no, the cult is everywhere. Like that essentially is one of two possible endings for a movie about a cult, right? It's either I've escaped and they're no longer a threat or hey, you can't escape the threat because they're everywhere and they're in power. Um, but overall, I mean, I think that this movie does a really great job of being so low key and yet being so disturbing, right? Again, talking about restraint, the idea that it is very story driven or premise driven, even if I don't necessarily think the dialogue between characters is all that nece uh, necessarily all that special. But at the same time, like Sarah is fantastic. And yes. the overall premise and kind of highlighting the intricacies of a cult rather than kind of like the horrific things that they do to the protagonist, again, I think something that I was reading into, like with that scene where I was like, oh, I assume that these creepy dudes are going to assault her. I think most of my inference is a, because they're having this young girl like bend over against a wall, which is a very kind of like compromising position. 
but also just again she sells the the terror of that scene and seeing how mm-hmm. terrified she is at least for me like it was like oh fuck the the most disturbing thing imaginable is about to happen to her given the situation she's in and the position and the vulnerability and all these things and then for the director to kind of reel it back and still have that scene be just as disturbing despite going in a different direction with that scene i think is very rare for a first time director like a for a uh, directorial debut for a horror film um but yeah i mean you know i i think this is a really good movie it's definitely something that i would recommend people to watch um i i think that this had a, a really good chance of you know cracking probably like my top 20 favorite horror movies if the ending was a little bit more unique Mm -hmm. um but yeah i i think i think the ending really kind of just dropped the ball not to hammer a little too much on that but um i I think they kind of they they missed a really good opportunity with that yeah i would agree with that and then at the same time i would say that this would make a fantastic double feature with the invitation right i feel like if you were going to watch those two movies, you'd watch The Invitation first because that is literally like a teeth-grinding bout of anxiety from start to finish. And then this film is equally disturbing, and yet I think it's a little... It's still disturbing, but it's a little lighter, right? It's not kind of like... It's not the slow burn that The Invitation is. This one is a little more immediate, and yet it still has fantastic performance from the lead. I think the concept is really interesting because in in The Invitation they don't really dive into the behind the scenes of the cult more than what we're given by these characters that are cultists essentially. Whereas in this, we get to see what somebody would be like and the process they have to go through to be inducted into that cult and seeing what the cult operates like behind that curtain as it were, which I think would make a really interesting contrast. But yeah, I mean, one BR, which is streaming on Netflix, I think is a really impressive, not only debut feature, but also just like a cult horror movie that combines like apartment horror. I mean, it's everybody's worst fear, right? You're gonna move into a new place and you don't know anybody. And one night you wake up and there's your cat in the oven and one of your neighbors is in your room, right? I mean, again, we've, I think we've all been there to one extent or another, <laughs> but uh, definitely giving me a little bit of a flashback for sure. Absolutely, but uh, as always, man, hey, I love chatting horror with you and I look forward to having you on again in the future. I, I appreciate you having me on, brother. Thank you, man. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service and follow at Daily Horror Habit on Instagram and at Daily Horror Pod on Twitter.